I am so excited today to be chatting with Chris Chun, who is a mega talented artist, fine artist who designs hand painted artwork um, in a modern shinazari style. And his detailed, super colorful work can be found on products all over the world from bedding to um, wall art, packaging. It's super beautiful. And he has this fascinating career that I cannot wait to dig into because he's been working for about 30 years in this industry. So welcome, Chris. Thanks, Elizabeth. You make me sound so old, but you make me sound so fabulous as well. Can you be my agent? <laughs> yes, of course. I sure would love to. Um, I feel like it would be very easy to sell your work because it is so, so, so gorgeous. And this hand-painted, uh, just beautiful stuff. So I, I'm, I am really excited to talk about um, what you've done with your career. But can you give me a, a first, give me sort of like, I know it's it's you've done a lot, but can you give me kind of like the highlights, give us a sort of a background, how you got to where you are? Yeah, so um, so I guess my love affair of pattern, I mean, it was just sort of predestined, I think, because I sort of I grew up in the 70s. So I didn't sort of realize it at the time, but looking back at photos like, you know, the kitchen had palm wallpaper, I had Mary Meko curtains in the in my bedroom and um you know, mum had chinoiserie fabric on her sofa, really. But I think, um, I mean, I've always been really artistic. But at school, I remember we did this um, with this this unit in maths, and that's when I first discovered Escher. You know, you know, mathematics and art, and sort of turning triangles into birds or whatever. So I remember really, really enjoying that um, that project. And then, you know, sort of school got in the way, and totally forgot about it, and. Um, I went to open university day. Do you have those open open days at university when you look at all the courses and meet the um, lecturers yeah, and I see what? I, um, yeah, so you can go check things out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I so I decided I was gonna do something creative and luckily, you know, my parents were not that Chinese conservative because I was gonna be a you know, doctor or lawyer, but I just decided, look, I, I really don't wanna do that, so. They said, well, you know, it's going to be tough because, you know, you're going to be a, a poor starving artist or whatever. So, um, yeah, that was my sort of first jumping off the cliff because I sort of thought, no, I think, I think I'm going to be okay. You know, I really want to follow my heart and everything. So we went to open day and um, I said, oh, maybe I'll do graphic design or fashion design or whatever. And I discovered textile design. I mean, it's called pattern design now, but I mean, I've always known that it's, it's textile design. Yeah. and I saw it and I thought, oh my God, patterns. I love it. Love it. But just this light bulb went off and I thought, yep, yeah, that's what I want to do. So I managed to get in there and I did a three year uh, Bachelor of Arts. And then I was really lucky to um, get a job working at Sheridan Bed Linen, which is an international Australian bedding brand that's still going now. I think it was set up in the the mid 60s or 70s I think but they were huge I mean they sold they sold in New York I think they had a they had a store in Fifth Avenue or whatever so I was super super lucky I mean that that really that job really provided me with the foundation of um you know of, of virtually everything I know because mm -hmm. you know we were, we were you know designing for international markets so you know obviously design that sold well in China you know wasn't necessarily the same colors that sold well in the states or in England or in right. Sweden so you know I sort of flew into all those nuances and um, I was fortunate enough to visit the factories because at that mm -hmm. time we were printing bed bedding in Australia so okay. I got a chance to go down and um, and do or supervise the bulk printing of the of the fabric which is really scary I mean, me, this little, you know, 20 year old something and all these, you know, factory workers looking around at the first strike offs and fabric and, you know, going, oh, now I need to change this and need to change that. And they're like, really? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're probably making, if, I, if it's anything like me, you're like, the green needs to be just a little bit bluer. And they're like, what are you even, who cares? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, it's all part of experience, isn't it? I mean, all those, all those nuances and learning about color and, and scale and pattern and everything. So I was um, I was at Sheridan for four years and then I left and went overseas and worked in um, the UK for a year and Italy for 
three years. So that's when I worked for uh, these textile design studios. So they're studios that uh, just sell pure designs, like mm. sell the copyright. And these are sold to, you know, everyone from Crate and Barrel to, you know, Giorgio Armani to, you know, everyone. So, you know, all these companies go to these trade fairs yeah. um, at Heim Textile in, in Frankfurt, which was um, sort of bedding and furnishings and, um, there's Premier Vision, which is, you know, fashion in, in yeah. Paris. And so um, that was a real, that was a real eye opener, another key moment of my career, because I, I worked in Europe for two years. And basically, um, I mean, I nearly, I had a heart attack, you know, the first time I started at um, Diane Harrison Designs in, in Manchester, because that was a furnishing um, bedding company that, you know, sold those type of designs. And, um, you know, the norm was to produce like a 27 inch repeat design a, a day, oh my a God. day, like hand painted. This is, you know, this is before computer and procreate yeah. and stuff. So, you know, it's all tracing paper and, you know, piecing together photocopies and stuff. And, yeah. and I was sick to the stomach because, you know, I'd had this blessed, um, you know, ideally uh, studio time in, at Sheridan where you know we had we had a week or two to spend on the design and um, you know really take our time and you know developing the pattern and the drawing and stuff and here it was just like no you got to churn 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 baby when we see new ideas and and bring them out so uh, so from you know working at Diane Harrison Designs for you I, I learned speed and yeah lots of different te techniques That's... which is really invaluable yeah and the... then I'll <laughs> let me just come in right there because um, talking no, no, about yeah. studios, um, like that's something that I had experience with working in house. And um, then once I graduate, uh, once I left uh, working in house, I started freelancing for some studios. But I wasn't actually an in-house studio designer. I was doing it remotely. And I think the experience is definitely different for someone who's like sitting in the studio and everyone's doing art around them. And it's like a mad dash, like from, I've, from, I've heard from like other people, other designers. And um, it's, it's a super interesting facet of the industry because a lot of people really don't know about it. Um, it's something I did a class on when I first started because, and, and I'm, I'm actually retiring that class this week, but somebody just emailed me and was like, you know, no one has a class on this. You're the only person I've ever heard mention this. And I, I was wondering why, like, it hasn't, it's not a bigger subject. And I think maybe it's because it's only for people who have worked in house that even really know how people who how corporations buy art in that way you know like if you're just if you started surface pattern designing because you lived I mean because you learned about it online and you just like took an online course you wouldn't necessarily know about that so no I, I, I mean just, definitely not I mean it's just I, I mean you know you think about you know your bedding and um fabrics and and clothing and I mean it comes from somewhere and these these are these are you know nine times out of ten developed by in-house studios so oh, yeah um so it's know, a big part of the industry it, that people really don't like know about exactly I'm sure exactly. a lot of people who are watching this interview are like wait what design studios and so yeah I just wanted to take a pause there and just say like yeah that's a that's a major part there are these big studios that just have artists in-house and as you said churning like it's really quick a, a day yeah, so amazing Oh, I mean, it was so inspiring. I mean, I, some of my best times of my life, really. And, you know, I'm still friends with the, you know, the, the girls in the studios. And, um, I mean, you know what, the, you know, the pattern community is really supportive and really yeah. friendly. And, I mean, it was, it was fantastic. You know, I mean, especially I, after uh, working in the UK, I moved to Rome and worked for this uh, renowned textile studio called Faro Disegni, which has been around for about 30 years or something. So, you know, they sold designs to, you know, Giorgio Armani and Diane von Furstenberg and stuff. So, you know, one week I'd be painting these beautiful tropicals on this, you know, silk paper. And then the next week I'd be like embroidering these velvets and, you know, I'd be working with, you know, designers from all over the world and, you know, with these old Italian mamas that had been working there for 20 years, you know, just that real, 
just that real craftsmanship and 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 attention to detail and and drawing and integrity that I think that's you know it's sort of got to be lost um you know the past few years especially with um you know I mean this I mean god there's so many people in the in the industry now these days isn't there yeah I mean, there sure is and I think the digital you know, for sure you know the because of like the rise of digital design especially I feel like with the iPad um, where you can where procreate brushes can mimic hand painting in many ways not I mean it's not the same but it can do a lot of the heavy lifting and that makes things you know yeah you kind of you do move faster so I mean the idea of moving fast in a hand painted photocopied tracing paper like I studied when I studied in college we did it, I did very little um uh, computer stuff. It, it was only like the last semester that we dipped into Photoshop and Illustrator. I did mostly gouache and yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a big undertaking to really, you know, work out a repeat with tracing paper. So I know. So did you, did you have to do the, did you do the ruling pin and ruler yeah. as well for doing stripes? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. I love that thing. I think I still have it in a, in a, um, you know, tackle bo art box somewhere. <laughs> Oh, that's hard. We're hardcore. Yeah, uh, yeah. You've, you've got the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Uh, for my, like, my anyone who might of... be watching who doesn't know, it's like this lid, this this pen-like thing, but it kind of is almost like tiny little tweezers, and it can hold um, paint and ink between it, and then you can use it as like a pen, but you're using paint. And so that's if you need to do something on a straight line or something very detailed, uh, you know, then you can use it like that. Mostly straight line because um, that's so funny. Um, so after you worked for some studios, then then where did that take you? Oh, so then I moved back to Australia and um, I got a job working as a product manager. So that was my first sort of management role, like doing sort of less design work, but more about um, manufacturing and doing costings and, you know, doing a bit more marketing and a bit more business orientated rather than just design orientated. So that was another huge um, pivotal moment in my in my career because it gave me the sort of foundation I mean it sort of built on from what I'd learned at Sheridan but it, you know gave me a perspective about you know um developing a brand and thinking about your customer and what your aesthetic is like and what your style and you know what differentiates your brand from someone else's brand and you know the little touch points that you can add at you know retail with you know packaging and you know, and mm. then again, it and still it all comes down to cost as well. So, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, I mean, often, you know, you might think, oh, I'd love to put that color in, you know, but it's going to cost like 10% more. So it's like, well, now we can't have that in. So, right. So I did that for a couple of years and then I moved up to, this was in Melbourne and then I moved up to Sydney and, um, I went out on my own so I just got a bit bored of um working in the industry and a bit disillusioned so I decided like I'm just going to do it on my own so um yeah so I, I ran out on my own and freelanced for a lot of different companies and bedding and furnishings and stuff and then um I even got a bit bit bored doing that and then I, um I was talking to a, an ex-colleague of mine who used to be a product manager that I worked with and she was opening a an art gallery that year and you know I said to her oh look I've always wanted to have a you know an exhibition you know like you know you've, you've always offers always wanted to go to Spain or you know go to Iceland yeah just so whatever, sure you know. <laughs> you know, something something in the distance but not in your immediate um you know horizon and yeah. she got at her diary and said okay when do you want to have it you mm. know and I was like well uh, I said oh Jillian you know, I don't I don't actually know what I'm going to paint but you know, and I, and I, you know, I'm not even sure what I'm going to do. And she said, oh, look, you know, if you, I've seen your designs, you know, just book in a time and I know that you'll make it a success. So this was in, this was in April and the exhibition was in November. So I did my paintings and it, and it sold out and um, I got contacted by the art group, which is a publisher in the UK that does greeting cards. I think they're still around. And yeah. they had seen a 
some of my paintings in a magazine. This was before, you know, internet became really big. And they said, oh, we want to license some of your paintings onto cards. Awesome. And it's really funny because I had been collecting um, cards from the art group for a while, you know, it's inspiration when you go on buying trips for new designs and, and colours. So it was sort of um, I don't know, serendipity, there. okay? Yeah, sort of yeah. full circle. Um, and, yeah, that sort of gave me the confidence to sort of think, oh, well, maybe I should, you know, get into a bit more licensing, you know, because I can do a lot of different styles and and, um, and genres and stuff. And so I went to Surtex and, um, in 2007 and um, had, well, no, actually before that I went to, actually I went to Surtex in 2004 for a recce. Just to, just to see like what was going on and yeah. you know that really opened my eyes up to you know the world of, of art licensing you know all these yeah. artists having stands there and you know different styles and genres and you know I just thought oh yeah I can do that I can do that you know I can do that you know but without really thinking about what's actually involved and then um 2007 I went over and had my first uh exhibition and met a few clients that I still work with today which is really good and um awesome. yeah I guess the rest is history yeah. um Built and then 10 there. yeah so I so I, I've been licensing since um since 2004 on and off really wow yeah um I did have a little bit of a sabbatical because uh one year we went to Canton Fair have you have you heard of Canton Fair I don't think so it's like the world's biggest houseware fair it's oh obs- okay. it's like obscene it's like it's like it's like heim textile but it's you know you've got these halls you've got i mean god what would be the equivalent i mean atlanta mart i've never been there but it's like you know you've got this massive exhibition hall mm. five floors and it's all like bathroom products like you know and then you've got another building that's just of um you know shower curtains and you know all the world's buyers went there and it just just really turned me off design actually like just seeing this mass consumption of you know product and thinking god where where's this all gonna go and and you know nine times out of ten the product that i was seeing there was like really really bad like Mm. you know really ugly and stuff and so it really made that was a really pivotal point of my career because I thought well look you know I don't really want to add to the landfill you know so yeah. from there I just decided look I'm just gonna I'm still gonna do things that are commercial but I'm gonna do things that um you know make a difference in the marketplace it's not there before and and you know add a little bit of beauty in the in in the world so that so that's so that's been my philosophy since since then basically I love that um um yeah awesome. so yeah, well, so that's so. Uh, that's um, that is. Uh, I mean, you can see how you know you've you've been trained. You know, going through all of those steps really is you know brought you to where you are today as far as you know the success that you've had. Um, but I was wondering when you first, um, well. I'm skipping around a little because I'm looking at my questions, but one question I have I want to start start asking about is that when you were first, like when you first did your, uh, left your um, production job, um, what, how did you start getting those freelance clients? Like, did you, was um, all people you already knew in the industry or did you, how did you like kind of advertise your services? Yeah, it was sort of, I mean, it was sort of people I knew in the industry and, you know, I did the old fashioned way of going to trade fairs and just looking who was by, who was doing what or whatever. I mean, I, I mean, this is in Australia and Australia's, I mean, Australia's really small. It's like 25 million. So, gotcha. um, you know, you, I can probably count on a, on two hands what, you know, the number of companies are working in bedding or, um, you know, furnishing fabric or whatever. And um, yes, I was basically working, I was basically designing for them all, or for them all really. So. Gotcha. So um, you just reached out to them more connected. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this was before I, this is before I even discovered licensing. So I was selling everything for flat fee really. Yeah. You know? But, and, you know, sort of built it into my business that I could travel overseas and, you know, do the retail shops and go and visit trade fairs. And then I'd come back and, um, develop storyboard showing the new colors and trends and everything and then I would 
you know, tailor it specifically to each client, what I think they should do, you know, because obviously they're different markets. And because, you know, I'm designing for, I'm designing for, for the competition basically. So, you know, I had to make sure that my handwriting was different to uh, everybody else's. And that's where my, that's where my training and experience from working in the uh, European studios really paid off because, you know, often time we had to do lots of different styles and, mm. and techniques and colours. So I've always made it a um, not really a signature style, but I've always, I've always, you know, tried to be the best at everything I could do because um, a lot of people in the studios, like if you were good at doing kids wear, that's all they got you to do. You know, if you're good at doing botanicals, that's all you got all you got to do. So, you know, I made sure that I could do, you know, everything quite well. So, you know, whenever there was a gap, I would say, Oh, Chris, can you do some damasks for us? And you know, after that, can you do some um children's and um stuff? So I'd like to see your um, children's wear. That would be interesting. Yeah, Knowing look, your current I mean, style, I would like to see what that what that looked like. I'm oh sure it was God, lovely. Done, it was I've just done, so funny because you were so I mean, I've done I've done cows jumping over moons. I've done unicorns. And, oh. You know, I haven't done llamas, but uh, yeah, I've done. I've done. A, I mean, I've done a lot. I mean, it's it's. Um, you know, I like the challenge as well. I get I get forward really easily. Yeah. I, that's you know, it's probably a, a flaw as well. But I'll just <laughs> tell you this, too. and then um, and then the last really important job I had working for someone was here in Thailand. So I was in Chiang Mai and um, I was driving by my tuk-tuk and I saw this, um, I saw this baby elephant statue, like, you know, this five foot baby elephant statue decorated in, um, you know, painting this really beautiful design and mm. the, the social enterprise was called Elephant Parade. And so elephant, I don't know if you've heard of elephant parade. It's like cow parade basically, but. Yeah, um, I've seen these different so, like, sculptures that are painted around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's, so they organize these open air um, exhibitions of, um, you know, baby lifelike elephant statues and they get different celebrities. Like, you know, we've had Katie, Katie Perry and Richard Branson, and, um, Brian Adams and, um, Prince William, you know, paint an elephant, and then they're they're exhibiting different cities around the world. And basically, um, Elephant Parade, what they do is they raise awareness and funds for Asian elephant conservation. Oh wow! And so, um, so I saw what they did, and you know, I just sent I just sent in a letter saying, oh, I'd really love to be involved because I, you know, I love your I love your um, your cause and your story. I think it's really unique and everything. And I sent this off in maybe June and, you know, I just completely forgot about it or whatever. And then they got in touch with me in December and said, oh, you're good. we'd really love you to do some designs for us. And so I did some designs for them and I got chatting and then, you know, the managing director said, oh, I can see you've had all this, um, you know, experience in product and, you know, design and stuff. And he said, oh, you know, would you like to be our global creative director and look after everything from wow. you know branding I did their licensing program uh, I designed their museum oh, wow. I did their I did all their branding and retail and visual merchandising so that was a huge huge learning curve but you know yeah. it's, it's so much experience as well so yeah. you know so I sort of feel lucky that I've worked in all different areas of the industry really you know from mm -hmm. the from ground up to managerial to um creative and I think what I've realized now is I do like to do a little bit of business stuff but my my heart and my passion is my is the creative really yeah that's so interesting yeah I mean so that's some I mean you know my career is <laughs> much less storied than yours I'd say but um one thing that we do have in common well is you're much we younger than me <laughs> well, one thing we do have in common is that we we both started in house, and you know the experiences that we gained from that have made a big difference on our sort of like more entrepreneurial part of our business or the you know independent part of our business. And I was saying before we started recording that it was you know there is a really big difference between people who learned you know design. Um, like online or if they learned it in school but didn't know about surface product design so they've just gotten into it like sort of via online channels versus you know someone who has started in the industry and and there's kind of a disconnect there honestly but 
what kind of lessons for people who have jumped in um, you know, online and would love to work in-house but don't have that opportunity because of wherever they live or whatever the situation is, what kind of lessons you know, do you think have served you the best having worked in-house? Um, well, I think, I think working in a house, you have, you have a huge advantage over someone that's just started because, you know, obviously you learn about manufacturing, you learn about marketing, you learn about the customer. I mean, it's all very well to, you know, design pretty patterns and put onto the product, but, you know, you really have to know who your, who your customer is. I mean, you know, every, every great artist or designer can paint whatever they want, but, you know, I think half the half the joy is being able to keep your designs, being able to connect with, with someone, you know, to, mm. to, you know, bring a smile and stuff. And, you know, if you don't, you've got to look at your designs the same way. If they don't, if they don't sell or they don't connect with your customer, then, you know, you, you, you've got to do, you've obviously got to do, um, do something else. Um, right. I don't know. I, I, I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in this industry because I mean, I've, you know, I've seen this phenomenal amount of, um, you know, people doing online courses, you know, saying, oh, it's really easy to do, do, you know, to do pattern, surface pattern design and, you know, you can license and make a good career out of it. And, you know, it's just not, I just don't think it's, 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 um, it's a lot more complex than that, really. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's it's tricky. It really is tricky because yes. um, it's like I see people who come into my like the the thought behind my class is that people there are so many there are so many designers that are super talented that have been learning how to design that have beautiful portfolios and don't have the like courage to put themselves out there to to get their work sold. Um, and that to me is like heartbreaking, right? It's like, you look at all that gorgeous art, like you're an, a, you're an incredible designer and it's just sitting there collecting dust. What's the point of this, you know? So that's, that's sort of like my ethos. However, I think, you know, it's, it would be, it's not true that every single person can, you know, make a fully sustainable living in this industry. Every single person who's ever created a pattern, that's obviously not true. And, and the market is very saturated and it takes a lot of tenacity to make those connections um, with clients and licensing partners and finding all those income sources to build up that makes it sustainable for you to do that full time. Um, you know, you were able to make those connections because you had the in-house experience and that did make it easier. And, and that helped me as well. It was, it was still hard for me. And I had those, some of those connections, you know? Well, I think, I mean, I think the other thing is we live in a society where it's just so instant. Everybody wants instant results. Like, you know, they say, oh, I want a license for pattern. I want to get a license. I want to make millions of dollars. I want to be famous. And it's just, you know, it's just not, yeah. It's just not, um, you know, it only happens to a, a, you know, really, really lucky few. And even then, you know, you've got to have all these sort of, sort of elements working together. You get them in the right place at the right time and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, you know, if you, if you want to become a surface pattern designer and, you, you know, you really work hard in it, then, you know, of course you can make a, you can make a really great career out of it. But, you know, I think if you think that, you know, you can put some designs onto a fabric or product and license it and think that, you know, you can make a, you can make a sustainable income from that, then I think it's a lot more difficult, especially if you don't have a unique style or, you know, signature um, look and, 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 store, and story about you. And I think that um, textile design, like, or I should say surface pattern design. What is the difference between surface pattern and textile design? I never... Great question. Um, I think that it is used pretty interchangeably, but I think the difference, uh, if I had to pick one out, I think the difference is that surface pattern design can be for any surfaces like wrapping paper and stuff. And textile design is not just for textiles, but usually I feel like um, a textile designer knows more about like weaves and like jacquard and all that kind of, you know, uh, you know, the difference between different types of actual like, you know, cottons and all that kind of stuff knows a little bit more about the manufacturing and 
rather than just a surface pattern designer just knows the art that goes on a surface. That's, that's what I would say, but I also think people use it interchangeably. Okay. All right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Because I was thinking, oh, what's, you know, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a textile designer. And a, I mean, I call myself a service pattern designer, but like, you know, for a while, you know, I mean, I know textiles enough. I mean, I'm not super deep in the weeds of like, you know, I don't remember all the stuff that I learned in in um, like working in house with like warp and weft and all the different like you know technical details. Yeah, about. yeah. So I see creating pattern like baking a cake because obviously like you know the number one thing you think about is like you know who's the cake who you're making the cake for. So you know when that you think about well you know who's my customer is it for my mom's birthday is it for a lunch is it for my um, Father's Day is it for, for whatever. So, you know, obviously the obviously, you know, the first thing before you do anything else is think about, you know, who your customer is and, and who's going to um who's gonna eat it or buy it, you know. Right. And then the and then the, you know, the second thing is we all have the same ingredients like, you know, flour, which is, you know, I put down as a repeat and eggs, which is the the motives, and then um you've got butter, which is, you know, the colour, the colour you use and You've got sugar, which is the the style of design you're going to use, whether it's um, you know damask or uh, you know spot or stripe or whatever. And then right. um, you know you've got vanilla, which is the the, the size of the pattern and, and the scale of the of the imagery and stuff. So, so how do how um, do you make it uh, that? How do you make that cake your own? You know, how do you make that? that okay, special? so. I think a lot of a lot of the courses these days are taught by people that haven't been trained that haven't been trained in proper textile. So they're they're just they're just telling you how to make a cake. Like so, you think about it like it's just like a standard cake mix, you know, with icing on top or whatever, and you know something that you can buy, you know, any supermarket anywhere in the world, quite mm -hmm. generic or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you know, for a surface pattern designer, you know, you've got the basics, how to make a cake, how to do a design. So, you know, you really have to think about, well, you know, what can I add to make it mine and my style to make it different? So you might think, well, okay, I'm going to do two layers. Of, I'm going to do a two layered cake today. You know, and one, one, one layer cake might be strawberry and one might be chocolate or whatever. Um, and then you might say, well, okay, but someone else is doing, um you know a strawberry chocolate cake as well and you might say oh, well okay well I'm going to use um I'm going to make my filling custard instead of normal cream or you know Italian meringue or or um or or custard or something you know and it's just then it's all yeah. these things like you know you know cake decorations and then you know oh yeah well my vanilla is sourced from Madagascar you know I, don't, I use <laughs> you know so you think about provenance as well and so you know, it's all these sort of different metaphors. You think, well, you know, I can add those little bits. Make is it the way that I, you know, paint the leaf, or is it, you know, the certain color that I use behind, you know, the stalk, or or a certain, um, you know, color combination that I use. Maybe, right. maybe, maybe I might just do cakes that you know only have two flavors or whatever. But I always use fresh seasonal, um, you know, ingredients. And so, you know, it's all these little, all these little things that. That, that make up a, a, a pattern yeah yeah I see what you're saying I wonder you know you were talking about how you had I'm going off script here but <laughs> no, no, that's you, were talking, you were talking about how you had um you know you've had so much experience doing all these different types of design now currently if you look at your website and your work it it all does have um you know a sort of overarching theme um and you know you would say that that is your style now I also have worked in so many different styles that I found it difficult to have one style coming out the gate of working um working for myself and licensing my art and I think there's a big uh difference between like licensing where sometimes it feels like you need to have your own style and be very distinct 
and like working as a freelancer or, you know, working as a studio, like studio artist, where it's actually a benefit to be able to do all these different types of things. And you're more, almost more useful if you can do all these types of things. And so have you found that, that divide and have you, and what is your, like, what do you think about that? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's a blessing. I think it's a blessing that we can design so many styles from working in house for a company, mm -hmm. but I think it's also a curse as well because yeah, it's like, well, I could do this and I can do that. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's almost like, well, you know, I've got too many options really. Exactly. Um, and I think you just have to, I think you just have to give it time. I mean, I think, I think over the, you know, over the course you'll find you're, you know, attracted to certain, you know, genres and colors and, you know, it might be the way you paint something and, um, you know, it might be a little flourish here, there, here or there. And, you know, that becomes your signature look. So I, so the Christian brand, so I'm, I'm sort of known for contemporary chinoiserie. So, you know, lots of um, nature inspired bird and flower paintings with, you know, color and, and pattern or whatever. But I also do designs for clients that are not my style at all but mm. I still license them so it's um so I have sort of like two distinct um areas of my business and I try and make sure that they don't overlap so if I did a oh, I don't know so if I did like a an old English floral you know a to a, for a customer and they wanted to license it under, you know, Chris Chun or whatever, I'd say, well, no, because that's not really, that's not, you know, that's yeah, what that's I'm not, that's not that's what I'm known for, you know. Yeah. So then do you have but, a second um, brand name that you do that or you just license it, but don't have, you, you use a licensing deal, but you don't put your like copyright on it? Yeah, well, I mean, I still, I never sign away my copyright. Mm -hmm. So I, I always, I always keep my copyright. So I don't, it's not really that important for me if it's, if my name's not not promoted or not really. I, I yeah. just I just want to get the royalties. So right, you know, it's, right. it's, it's, it's um okay. So that's that kind of brings me to something that that, that yeah. I was curious about. Does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, that's that's something you know. It sounds like you do have two different styles, and you do kind of separate what's what's yours and what's what's for clients. And that's something that I do too. You know, I mean, there are certain things that, I mean, I specifically design for like the way I think of it is my licensing portfolio versus my like client work and my licensing portfolio is what I want to do. And in theory, it's my style, though. I will admit that it is pretty uneven because there's lots of different styles I like to try, but what I do for clients is often, yeah, not necessarily my style. Um, and I just do it as it is. So, but it sounds like you're, I was thinking that because I saw in your, on your website that you have, you know, your licensing and you also sort of do a design studio. My thought was that that was, you were selling outright. And so you're saying that you don't sell outright. You just design to their specifications, but it's still a licensing deal. Yeah. So I, I mean, I used to sell, I used to sell outright and I was thinking, Oh my God, I'm making so much money for these, for these, you know, for these companies, you know, I want mm. a piece of the pie. So I, um, I decided to just license and, and stuff. And the other thing as well is that, you know, you can make, you can make a really good living just selling flat out designs and, you know, just churning out. But I mean, for me, I found it quite exhausting creatively, just, just, just constantly churning out new ideas, you know, all the time and, 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 and stuff. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I like to do stuff that, you know, has meaning and, you know, has a story behind it that I think, you know, makes a difference rather than, you know, add to the landfill. I mean, you know, the, I mean, you know, there's so many other designers that, that can do that. So I, I, you know, I think, yeah, I think it's, yeah, look, I think it's, I mean, you know, I mean, I remember when I first, when I first went to Surtex and I was thinking about, you know, licensing myself as a brand and, you know, it, it took me a while to find my own style, but I think, I think it, it would just come, it would just come. Like, it, I don't think you need to, necessarily force it all you know or freak out that you haven't found it because mm. you know oftentimes 
you know, you, you actually do have a style, but you just, you know, you just can't see it. You yeah, know, everyone's it, blind it to their own portfolio. With, with fresh eyes, you know, to, to, to look at it and think, oh, yeah, look, you know, you're, you do have a, you do have a style, you know. Yeah. You do have a style for sure, so. Um, well, that makes sense about o- only doing licensing, especially for your work, because from, you know, what I've seen, it's so detailed, it's so hand-painted, well, it is hand-painted, it's, it, it seems like it must take you a long time to create any one piece, even though you're talking about having the experience of being able to do a design in a day, um, is that, that's not your current pace by any means right I mean you must have slowed down oh god no I don't <laughs> slow down a lot oh my okay. god <laughs> I didn't think so I mean I would be like shocked so I get so, ex- I get exhausted I get exhausted if I work like four hours straight you know, I like, know. Like, oh, god, I need it, you know? <laughs> yes me too and I'm not even like hand painting anything so I feel you oh so, like that no, you know, I mean, you- the idea of sort of, we were talking about design studios before and and my experience having been in-house and, and looked through tons and tons and tons of art um, to, for buying purposes and to buy it outright, um, you know, kind of the top of that price range is like $1,200, 13, 14, max, max. And that's pretty rare. I think your work would qualify because it is hand painted and whatever. So, uh, you know, selling it outright, uh, if that if that was kind of the price range that you used to sell at, you know, it's definitely not sustainable for something where you're, you know, you're putting in all that detail and time and all that kind of thing. Well, I, I mean, it's when I was freelance, I didn't, I didn't really do as detailed back then but I mean I think I mean I think you're right like for furnishing fabrics the you know the norm was like anywhere from 800 to 1200 I mean it could even go up to 1200 or even I mean I know I remember at Sheridan we bought we bought a couple of beautiful florals from these Japanese studios and they were like I think they were two and a half thousand this is back in that this is back in the mid 90s or something but I don't think I mean, I don't think the prices have gone up. In, in actual fact, they I think they've gone in down like a bit. Thirty years, they haven't. They yeah. Sure haven't. It's I think like you gone can down. Still so eight hundred to twelve hundred for homewares, from what I can tell, and apparel is super cheap, as you probably know. So it's kind yeah. of wild, and that is something that is, you know, it's. I, I see two sides of it because having worked in house, it's like. Well, I get why they don't have the budget to do so much more than that, because a lot of times you're getting this artwork and you're presenting this artwork and then the artwork doesn't even go through, like you don't end up using it because, you know, the VP doesn't think that that is going to work for their line or the retailer doesn't want it because it doesn't work with their line or whatever it is. So you kind of don't end up using it. So you can't be paying 2,500 for every piece of art you ever like present on the other hand, you know, it's like for an independent artist, you know, now that I work for myself, it's like to sell, you know, my work for $500 or $400 or something like that is, is not sustainable for me, you know? So it's really, it's really tricky to, to sort of wrap my head around pricing these days because I, I've seen both sides, you know? So do you, do you, do you have a stock of designs that you show or do you just design to commission? Um, so for my life, for licensing, I do have a stock of designs that can be licensed, but as far as my freelance work, I just design to what, um, to specification. Yeah. And, oh, okay. and, you know, sometimes I do it by project and sometimes some of my, um, designs I do hourly even, and that's an, a whole other discussion because obviously, you know, I work pretty fast. And so hourly isn't always like the most profitable thing. And, um, but I'm doing designs that I'm not that invested in, or it's not even necessarily a full, like, all right, create a repeat with cats in it. Sometimes it's like, do a cover for a planner with cats in it and then like an end paper and then put some words like a quote with like a little flower in the corner you know it's like all this kind of different pieces bits and pieces that make it a little bit harder to 
lay out a whole pricing structure. So sometimes hourly makes sense, um, but it's it's tricky. I'll tell you. Yeah, you just gotta you just gotta charge enough for your hourly rate, really. Yeah, well, that's the thing, definitely. And and hourly, I have found with freelance is in in surface pattern specifically is is lower than other art disciplines. You know, a graphic designer can easily charge one hundred and twenty five dollars an hour. A surface pattern designer has to find the right client to charge that much per hour for sure. Well, I mean. I mean, I think, it, I mean, look, I think it depends. I mean, it depends on your experience. I mean, obviously you're just starting out. There's, I mean, there's no way you can charge, you know, 125, you know, an hour. But I mean, but God, you definitely can because you've, you know, you've got two decades for sure. All right. Well, Chris, you inter introduced me okay. to some $125 clients and I would love to work with them, but it's, 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 it's tricky. It really is tricky. And I, I mean, I'm not saying that I know I'm worth it, but, I, but it is really hard to, uh, you know, I am totally willing to advocate for myself and to like negotiate and all that kind of stuff where I think a lot of women in this industry aren't there they're not willing to advocate they're not they're too nervous they just want the work and they're too nervous to negotiate and all that stuff and that's a big problem in itself but even as someone who's willing to you know say hey this is my work is worth it it's still you know it's still tricky to find those clients that that have that kind of budget um, especially with margins tightening and all the things that are happening um, with you know i don't know with retail at this point so yeah no look look i understand i i mean i think it's i mean i think it's a i think it's a problem not just in surface pattern but a lot of creative you know arts industries it's like you know people you know they say oh you're an artist you know can you can you do this can you paint my cat you know for free or you know just give me yeah. 50 dollars or whatever they don't put any they don't put any value on it and i think you know i i sort of made a decision a long time ago you know saying well look no look this is what I charge and this is what this is what I'm worth and if you don't want to pay it then you know you can go and find someone else but they won't be able to do as good a job as you and I think you know I mean the other thing you're talking about I mean obviously someone that's just into the industry is obviously not going to charge the same rate as someone like you with 20 years experience or even someone that has a degree in you know service pattern design or and you know has worked in industry so i think so i think in terms of finding it in industry standards it, it's you know it's 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 quite it's quite um it's quite tricky isn't it really it is and i the other question i wanted to ask around pricing for you is um not so much for an hourly but when we're talking about buying outright um you know there's often a difference when, you know, for studios where a more complicated pattern, something with a lot more detail that obviously took more, more time to create um, costs more uh, and a simpler pattern costs less, which, okay, in theory, you understand why that is because obviously it takes longer to do the more complicated pattern. But on the other end of this, uh, other end of it, you know, the, the end product of, you know, betting with a very complicated design versus betting with a simple design could sell equally as well and could make the same amount of money for a, um, for a company. So, you know, what's your thought about, about pricing based on how complicated something is or detailed? Um, well, I agree with exactly what you said, but I think you know, the fact that it takes someone more time and more hours to do the design, they should be, they should be paid more for it. You know, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that, you know, that's just the way it is. I mean, it's not, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sell more than the simpler design, but it's mm -hmm. just, I mean, it's just, um, I mean, it's just the way the, yeah. the, I mean, it's just the way it works. I mean, it's like if you, um, I mean, it's like if you bought a cake, like you, know, just, right, yeah. you just want a one layer cake, you know, it's going to be a certain price and then you buy a wedding cake you know, and it's a three, wedding, a cake wedding cake for $700 then, you know, or whatever. Yes, it's, of course. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. So, you yeah. know, it's, it's, that doesn't mean that the, the cheaper cake is, is going to taste worse than the wedding cake, but it's just, it just takes more time. So, right. you know, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. Well, that's why the licensing model is so appealing because if you do a simple design or a complicated design, if they 
if one sell, whichever one sells the best, you're getting, you know, you're getting that compensation either way. So that's, yeah, that, that's the I mean, appeal of licensing. Well, I mean, I just don't know why more companies don't do it because like, you know, if you license in something and it doesn't sell, well then, you know, you, you don't have to fork out that, 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 you know, that, that money to pay for mm. that, for that design. I mean, especially if you can't negotiate in advance, but you know, that's yeah. a whole different no. Yeah. I think I think that comes down to bookkeeping, don't you? You feel like the book, the amount of like keeping track, especially uh, like fashion companies that deal with a lot of patterns in their lines every season. Yeah. Think about all I the bookkeeping think. involved in like keeping track of what each, you know, print is selling and all that kind of stuff. I feel like that's a whole hot mess. So I understand why. <laughs> want to dig into it but what I will say is something that I've been hearing about more that I kind of like is the idea of a flat fee license that is limited in term so the idea of like licensing out artwork for whatever $750 but only for two years because truly a fashion company or any company is usually either going to use it right away or not use it at all right it's either gets passed or doesn't get passed it might come back around when i worked at the gap i would always be digging through the archives and finding old prints to like bring back to life but most people don't have the time or the the i don't know they don't have the bandwidth to do that because everything is so fast paced that i feel like a, a flat fee short-term license would be a good solution for most people um, absolutely yeah all right. Absolutely. Well, let's start campaigning I mean, for I, that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, that's what I do. I mean, I think, you know, for, I mean, for an artist or designer, your, I mean, your IP, that's your, I mean, that's potentially your retirement fund. You know, that's that's your, you know, that's part of your archive and legacy. So, I mean, I remember before before I got into licensing. Um, you know, when, when companies wanted to pay a flat fee, well, then we just said, well, okay, you've got, you can just use this design for this product area and this territory, like, you know, just for Australia, New Zealand, that's it. And, you know, we can use that design anywhere else. So, and, you know, they were quite happy with that. But, you know, I just think, you know, to sell your design away and your rights, I mean, you know, there's so much potential, even just recolouring something can, you know, instantly mm -hmm. give it a whole new, look and, and appeal and you know it could sell like you know for hotcakes really so yeah totally so yeah so even though even though you might sell for flat fee yeah don't keep the copyright for sure yeah and that's yeah. sort of not the way I feel like it's traditionally done at least in the U.S. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can't go in that direction if if you know everyone I don't know it, it requires it requires a movement, right? And a, and, a, and a shift in thinking. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, I think for someone that's had experience like, like us or, you know, five years or, you know, probably trained that I think, you know, you can do that. But I think for someone that's, I mean, you know, advice, if it's, you know, you ask me for advice for someone starting out the industry, I would just say, look, you know, just, you've got to get as much experience as you can just, to, you know, just, design as many different styles and genres and you know get as much work and just you know they want to play flat fee just just sell flat fee because at least you know you're getting experience you've got um you know getting customer contacts you can see what you know what works and what doesn't work and you know after a couple of years and you'll know you'll know what what sells and what doesn't sell and you'll know what you like designing and not like designing and then from there you'll be able to build up your um brand and style and, and offer something you know unique in the marketplace but yeah i think i i don't think i mean i think for yeah for someone starting out you know i i just just to sell it yeah <laughs> i don't I, I mean i mean you know i look at i look at my designs that i did when i first started out it's like yeah i don't want to keep the copyright for that because yeah not, well that's the know, thing it's not... like the stuff that i've had for for um <laughs> you know even my licensing portfolio it's like i started licensing in 2013 and yeah if i look back at some of the i still have you know collections that never took off and if somebody offers me you know 700 dollars for it i'm like take it take it i don't want it you know like it's old yeah. for me and it's and i'm over it and 
who cares you know but yeah I mean it's a, I mean it's as you said before I mean I was listening to one of your things it's I think you know working for a company you become less precious about your about your artwork you know yeah, so it's, I really um, do. and and know, I think that's like to... a benefit as you said kind of blessing and a curse it's like it has served me really well because I'm willing to take some of these jobs that maybe somebody who just learned to design but is feeling extremely precious about like this is my first pattern that I made that's so like oh god it took me 14 hours and it's the most important thing I've ever done versus me and I'm like yeah whatever just take it the whole point is I'm an artist for like money like I'm a designer to get paid like that's whatever but then on the other hand it's like I get to a point where I you know I look at other people who who's you know, we're like, I wouldn't ever work for under $125 an hour or something like that. And I'm like, you know, it's, is it because I'm so kind of cavalier about my art that I am at a point where I'm undervaluing it? So I don't know. I mean, there's no answers. This is just things that I personally have been like thinking about as, as someone who's seen both sides, you know? Well, I think, yeah, I think, like, I think you just gotta, you've just gotta, you know, have a certain, have some, have some, some structure in place saying, well, look, you know, I'm just not going to do that. I'm just not going to do that, that yeah. sort of, you know, yeah, you have to definitely have that a- sort of work for that, for that sort of price, really. I mean, you know, you think, well, okay, the hours that I'd spent doing that, they're not going to pay me, then I'll just, you know, spend it developing my, my own work and my own portfolio. And, you know, you'll probably find that that'll make, you know, a lot a lot more money for you than than doing something yeah um totally or um the part where chris is giving me uh art therapy or, or business therapy <laughs> <laughs> i get on these interviews well, no it's true i mean it's, it's about um... my issues <laughs> <laughs> i'll say well so you're very experienced can you please tell me how <laughs> Um, all right. So let's, let's start to wind down one. Uh, well, I have two more questions. There's my bonus question, but first, before I dip into bonus question, what would you say to people who think this industry is getting too saturated, right? Is there, is there enough space for people to make a sustainable living new people who are coming in? Cause this is, this is all we've been talking about related to pricing is like, well, when it feels like someone can do it for whatever, $40 an hour, then it's hard to charge 125 an hour, you know? So what do you think about that? Um, well, I think if you're, if you're, Offer, offering supermarket cake mix desi- designs in no it's not sustainable yeah but you know if you're going to offer something that is um unique and has their own um place in the in the market then for, absolutely for sure i mean you know definitely i mean i think this i think this also a myth now is is like well you know surface pattern it's like you know, you have to license. You have to license everything. It's like the be and be all and end all, and and you know, it's it's not. You can just you know, license for a flat for a flat fee. Just keep your copyright, but you know, just and just just, just churn it because, I mean, all these textile studios that we've been talking about. I mean, they're, they're still there's this whole there's this whole. I feel like there's this whole other, as you said, there's this whole other world that you know, everyone is sort of ignoring because they all they look at is the you know the stars and the lights so you know i can i can you know design something and get it licensed and you know it's i mean you know nine times out of ten it's just not it's not sustainable for sure yeah but i mean i know are I mean, still profitable so i mean people look there's yeah, more they are. there's they more are. product than ever like when i look around and just think about yeah as you said kind of like i have been to atlanta and you look at all the products and all the artwork and when I first went to Atlanta Mart and, and saw all that, my thought was like, my art should be on so many more. Like why I should be licensed on 4,000 things because there are 10 million things. I only need a small piece of it, but it's still, you know, so the, the opportunities are there. Someone's designing this work. It's just, I mean, you know, finding it is obviously difficult and and having that, having that marketable work, right? The work that fits well, in. Oh yeah, I mean, it just, I mean, you know, you just gotta think of like it's, you know, like, um, okay, I'll use another analogy. It's like, it's like, um, 
you know, a Hollywood production company, you know, we're going to release 10 movies a year. That's it, you know, and you've got all, and, you know, because you've got thousands of people auditioning for the, for the roles and the movies and stuff. And, you know, obviously there's not, there's not enough to, to go around for everyone. It doesn't mean that you're not talented. It's, you know, you've got to be in the right place at the right time and meet the right people. And, you know, nine times out of 10, it doesn't have anything to do with your talent or ability or designs at all. It's mm. just, you know, it's just, it's just luck pure luck so luck and persistence if you ask me luck and persistence i mean um it, it is it's it's like a marathon because it's um i mean i i just i just recently signed a, a licensing deal and you know with the company that i spoke to 11 years ago we spoke to 11 years ago and i hadn't heard from them <laughs> until like a few months ago so you know it it, you, just, you, just, you just don't know it, it, you yeah. know, it, it can happen. I mean, you've you just got to be really nice to everybody and, you know, be really respectful and, and, you know, I think make sure that your designs, you know, have integrity and there's some sort of, you know, authenticity about them and, and, you know, and it's like everything quality just rises to the top. So it's, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm still, I'm still licensing designs that I did like 15 years ago. It's amazing. So that's amazing. It's, and that's the dream. Yeah. Like you're, I think, I think that's, you know, that's what everyone who hears about licensing, they hear these like success stories of people who can do that. It's like that, that's kind of the dream that was sold to me about licensing. I was like, once I make a portfolio, it can be used over and over and over again. And it's true that I have collections that have been licensed over and over and over again, which I'm very fortunate about, or, you know, it's very fortunate, but then there's also many that didn't go anywhere, you know? So, and I think that that is most people's experience with licensing. And then there are those few who have these like careers that, you know, continue to, to sort of blossom and people are, their work is very sought after. So, um, you know, that's amazing. Um, well, let's dig into the bonus question. Uh, okay. I could be, I could ask you 1 million more questions, but, but we'll dig oh, into you can. the this bonus question. <laughs> We've already been talking a lot about uh, pricing and money and stuff. And uh, uh, if you've seen any of my interviews, you know that my bonus question tends to do with money and income, because again, I'm trying to get, let everyone know what the realities of this sort of industry are so that they can judge for themselves if this is, you know, a good path for them. Um, I'm thinking the answer to this is going to be pretty quickly, but let's find out. How long did it take you to make a full-time living as an artist once you left your uh, job, like when you went into freelancing? Sign up for my free surface pattern design toolkit and in it you can hear the answer to this bonus question as well as Chris talking about which of his streams of income create the most revenue for him and his thoughts on ways for artists to be more successful and stand out in this industry. Well, thank you so, so much, Chris. This has been amazing. Um, I will put all your information and links in the description because people are definitely gonna wanna check out your work. And um, I'm so glad that I get a chance to chat with you today. So nice, Elizabeth. I think you're doing a great job. Oh, thank you thank so you much so for much. having me. Of course. Check out the description below to see more of Chris's work and to learn about how to work with him as a surface pattern design coach. If you love learning about surface pattern design and creative business, be sure to subscribe to this channel and follow me on Instagram at eSilverDesign. Also, I would be super grateful if you shared this channel with your surface pattern friends. Thank <laughs> you.